and welcome to the Adventures in Arting podcast, where we analyze, explore, and celebrate the creative journey. My name is Julie Faithan Balzer, and I am a working artist living outside of Boston. I've been hosting this podcast with my super special co-host and my mom, Eileen Chu Balzer, since 2012. So this is episode 146. It is the second part of our conversation about abstract art. I think I originally called it something like, what's the point of abstract art? But I think that the podcast has ended up being much more about our likes and dislikes. So I hope you enjoy the second half of this discussion, whether you're listening to the podcast or watching it on YouTube. Uh, okay, so next up, our two artists I'm also sure you've never heard of because these are artists I follow on Instagram. I wanted to bring the conversation a little bit into like what people are making right now. So I picked two of the artists who I happen to like, who are artists who sell a lot of work through galleries, but they're not like museum famous. They're not like anything like that. So Michael Hedges is the first one. And if you want to follow him, it's at Michael Hedges Art. I picked two pieces from his Instagram feed. The The dates have question marks because I went off when he posted them, assuming he had made it in the timeline that he posted them. So they are both vertical canvases made up of um, sort of like a maze of shapes is the best way I can think of it, or shapes all put together. They are different in style. The one on the left has a more sketchy quality where there kind of are some outlines. There are some shapes that are not filled in. There are colors. There's clearly use of either oil stick or crayon or something that's more of a drawing material in there. On the right, the shapes are more um, smooth. It seems much more like almost everything's painted. The um, there's, But there's still in both of them a kind of jumbled quality that, again, I really respond to of these idea of these shapes in motion. They remind me, particularly the one on the right, the one with the more sort of smooth area of like a fantastic improv quilt almost where it's like, you know, little pieces that gets stuck together to create something more because in several instances there are shapes that are the same color that butt up against each other or that are the same value that create a larger shape either by accident or on purpose as opposed to being a shape sort of in of themselves so mom you've never seen this work before i'm sure uh so the one on the left is called untitled and the other or maybe it's not called untitled they just didn't have a title in the post and the one on the right he put the title in the post it's called hunting for ghosts okay so the one on the left uh, i prefer to the one this on the, is the right more sketchy one, one just so because, everybody can see them i feel like there's more action i feel like there's more turbulence i feel that I uh, have been offered the opportunity to enter into this painting and hunt for things and feel the wind on me and uh, twirl around a little bit. And uh, there's a kind of a jingle jangle feeling. Uh, the one on the right, it's funny you said quilt. Uh, now that you've said it, I can see it, but it has a more static feeling to me. And for some reason, I'm not responding to the colorway, the colorways that are in there. It's, I think sometimes I'm very sensitive to how color makes me feel or the combination of colors. And this one just isn't doing it for me. I also feel like there's a lot of white on the top that's kind of floating which almost makes it two different pictures the top versus the bottom uh, to me there's something unresolved about this one again this is just my reaction to it mm -hmm. whereas the left one to me is more of a whole the thing that i find so interesting is so when the difference for me when i look at like famous artists throughout time who are collected by museums versus artists on instagram the biggest difference that I see is I often find that I have suggestions, which I don't give, for the artists on Instagram, you know, where I can say like, Michelangelo. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Michelangelo, I feel less like I have a suggestion. What I, I guess what I mean by that is so often when I look at work in a museum, what I see is that the work is complete. I may not respond to it 
personally, but I can't think of something that I would take away or add that would immediately make it better. You know what I mean? Like okay. it feels complete. It is the most, whatever better that for is. You. Better for you. And remember, those yeah. are the things in the museums. Those are the things that have been purchased by somebody. Right. So they're the most successful at reaching people. Right. From and that's just the point I wanted to make. It's not to say like if Basquiat wasn't posting on Instagram, you wouldn't feel like, oh, I don't like this one or I do like that one. It's just that the thing that are in museums, like it's just always good to remember because that's the majority of what we look at when we're sort of talking through our history or that's what you often have the opportunity to see. And it's just remembering like that's the most finished version of it. That's the most polished. That's like the best one that they have. There's a hundred more of them in the basement that don't get to see the light of day because they're not as good. You know, and that that's the idea. Whereas sometimes right. when I look at art on Instagram, I have an easier time saying like, oh, I think like if there were one larger shape, it would really help set this composition off. Or oh, if there were, what, you know what I mean? As opposed that's to our reaction. Right. Again, not to say it's right or wrong. It's just, that's the way it makes me feel. Right. This one, In order to right. meet, right. In order to meet my right. aesthetic. Right. It's the same thing as like a thousand people can tell me all day long, you should put a belt on that, you know, so to show off your waist. And I would be like, ha, 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 the day I wear a belt is the day I fall to the ground and die. Because we all just have things that either like may or may not be true about ourselves, but we're just not going to do or we are going to do. And I think the same is true. A look you that. don't like. I mean, yes. you don't. So nothing to be said further. exactly but the plenty of people in the world love to wear belts and rock right. on if you do okay so then this is one more artist i picked from instagram her name is claire kirkup uh if you want to follow her she's claire dot kirkup that's her um, instagram name uh, so one piece is called sky high it's a 2024 piece the other piece is called the theatrics of normal 2023 she is an australian artist so these are both large canvases um sky high contains a lot of kind of uh, the best way i can describe them is scribbles with a paintbrush some are large some are small some are thin some are fat there are some uh like scribbly shapes underneath some of the thinner scribbles then uh the theatrics of normal has some qualities of a grid going on as if it's been pieced together there are sort of some defined places where some of these kind of spindly lines stop and start there are a lot of sort of fat lines mixed with some thin lines it's uh the palette is somewhat neutral heading towards pink with a couple dashes of dark sort of grayed color in it I find these pieces to be very active very interesting they show the hand of the artist uh for me some of them make me think of nature i can see flowers in sky high i can see tree roots in the theatrics of normal personally in my work i like to draw a lot of inspiration from nature and bring nature elements into my work in an abstracted way there's something just active and alive about them. The pictures for me are also, I enjoy seeing, she almost always takes the pictures in her studio with her paint splattered floor and her paint splattered wall and her stool for scale. And like, you just have a sense of them as pieces that somebody has created that are kind of alive. So I like the whole sort of things surrounding them along with the actual pieces. So mom, you've never seen this work. Do you respond to it or do you I not? would have to think about it a little more. First question, is the one called Sky High, is that a square or is the top, I can't tell from the photo, or is the top like uneven? I believe it's a square. Okay. I actually was hoping it was uneven. Um, it would help me with the feeling that the, the forms are trying to escape the canvas. Mm. Uh, I will say that of the two, the color palette of the one on the right, which is called the theatrics of normal, I respond to more, partly because I'm not a pink person. And although they both are from the same color palette, somehow the pink on the left, it, the flower thing, I just, I'm starting to feel a little bit like chintz. Do you know what I mean? Chintz fabric. I'm mm -hmm. starting to feel a little 
English cottage kind of thing, which I, lo I like English cottage, but somehow it's not speaking to me. I like the one on the right a little more. I like that stuff that almost looks like muddy paint water. Mm -hmm. On the right, there's a whole section. I like the fractionated effect of the different, almost like you're looking through broken glass at this image. Um, I somehow feel that the left one, Sky High, is a little frenetic and uncontrolled. All the squiggly lines and looking like tangled skeins of yarn or something. Whereas the one on the right seems more deliberate. Um, and I just respond to it better. Teeny bit of blue could be the window, a uh, window. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with the green ball in it could even be a person or a mannequin. Mm -hmm. I just somehow feel I'm looking, I'm having a look into something and there's a depth mm -hmm. because of that. I'm looking through maybe this broken window into a room or chamber. Whereas on the left one, it's much more on the surface to me. Mm -hmm. And that's less appealing. Well, I would say like having heard you talk about all the different abstracts today and the stuff that you like, like uh, definitely you like movement, but you like a sense of control in it. There's a sense of elegance that you're looking for. You like things that are, that don't have that kind of chaotic feeling, but feel like you know, they can feel spontaneous, but at some level have to be, you know, within a control. And that makes sense to me because I think there is, I see that difference, that dichotomy very clearly in these two, two pieces where one feels a little bit more elegant, even I might say, than the other. So let us talk a little bit about the things that we don't necessarily respond to. My first pick for something I don't respond to is Barnett Newman. So Barnett Newman is famous for, uh, do we say it inventing? I don't know. Coining the phrase zips. And zips were basically this idea where he would have a large canvas and there would be a vertical line or two or three or several. And that's a zip. Um, and so a lot of his work is, again, in this kind of color field idea. I have two paintings up here. One of them uh, is called Ornament Six from 1953. And I believe this is one that came up for auction at Christie's, where it went for several million dollars. Uh, the other one is called Uriel from 1955. It's a museum photo. And I just wanted to get a little, again, the sense of scale. These are very large paintings. Ornament. Uh, six is a almost square uh, horizontal rectangle. Uh, it is like, mm, what color? It's like a bright, bright, bright blue, like a royal blue with a single white zip down the center. Uh, Uriel is uh, a long, skinny, horizontal rectangle. It has a kind of uh, sea glass blue color on three quarters of it. Then uh, like two sort of brown zips. And then the end of it is a very, very dark brown. So it's almost like the brown comes into the sea glass color and then goes zip, zip, but it's very clean. It's not like it doesn't it doesn't fade into it. It very cleanly goes into it. So I do not like Barnett Newman uh, or I do not respond to Barnett Newman because to me it's like too held. I sort of historically understand why he's important, why people call him a genius, why he's such an important artist. I understand intellectually like why the zip is an important idea. I just, to me, they're boring and I just, I'm not interested in like looking, there's sort of no sense of movement again to me, to me. Mom, are you a Barnett Newman lover? No. Um, and I'm going to tell you that that photo of Uriel on the right mm -hmm. has a statue, I guess for scale or for something. And imagine that photograph without that in there. It would be even more boring. It just, to me, it, this is intellectual without having any emotion. Right. I think so there is some abstract art that's intellectual, I mean, and I have trouble with that. 
So speaking of which, this was one of your picks for an artist you don't like, Joseph Albers. So Joseph Albers is like the color theory guy. He spent his life dedicated to color. He wrote a very famous book, which I happen to have here because I'm teaching this color class called the uh, Joseph Albers Interaction of Color. Uh, and it's he so the two pictures here one is from his famous homage to the square this one is soft spoken from 1969 it's a series of four nested squares that uh vary in uh color so there's like a teal and then kind of a kelly green and then a forest green and then a really 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 almost black green on the inside the squares are not nested so that the littlest square is in the center it's more like they're sort of sunk to the bottom oh my doorbell just Someone's rang at the back door uh, so it's more like they're sunk to the bottom uh, and then the second piece is six variants the did you just freeze did I just freeze? Yeah. You froze okay. for a moment. I'm going to tell you who's at the doorbell. I bet it's your son coming home from school. <laughs> Never mind. He likes to what run I the back doorbell. Okay, I'm making notes. Is Hold on a second. This don't talk. Don't talk. Don't talk. Because I'm going to have to have a clean pickup. So I'm just going to have to talk about six variants. So hold on. So six variants from 1969. Uh, this looks a little bit like a cassette tape to me. It's a screen print. And what you get is you get six variations of this design with different colors in the different places if you were to purchase this. Um, and it's, again, he what he's interested in is color relativity. How do colors change when they're up against each other? So mom, why did you pick Joseph Albers as someone you don't respond to? Again, I think it's leans so far to the intellect side for me, away from the emotions side. And I just, I can't look at them very long. I, I appreciate the skill and the thought. I appreciate the, what, that they have certain interesting, challenging things. If you look at the homage to the square, at certain points, it seems like this little one in the middle is moving, changing size. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And if you look at six variants, you realize it's not exactly in the middle. There's more yellow on the left than on the right. And I, I just, I don't have anything to say about them because they don't move me. Yeah, I would say I feel very similarly about it, which is to say Joseph Albers, so smart, so important, so like well-spoken about color. It's fascinating to look at his work. Uh, but again, like I find it an intellectual exercise rather than an emotional one. And I think abstract art can be that for many people is, about, is questions about intellectual questions about how to put things together. To me, it's technical. Okay, not. hold on. Hi. Mama. Look at this is Munga. I'm talking to Munga. Do you want to see? Munga. Hi. Hi, Munga. So, if you are watching this podcast on YouTube, you probably noticed that uh, I look very different than I did one second ago, and so does mom. Uh, so, my son came home from daycare and he came bounding upstairs to the studio to see me. So, we had a little podcast interrupt us. So, now uh, post bath and shower and everything for him, uh, we're resuming our conversation. So I apologize if anything gets repeated. So welcome back, even though it feels like we never left. <laughs> so we were talking about Joseph Albers, and I think we were just getting past uh, sort of why he's important, but we're not necessarily interested in his work. And I feel like we could probably move on to talk about Jackson Pollock. Who I thought this was an interesting one for you to pick, Mom, because I have a very strong recollection 
of standing in front of one of his drip paintings and being like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I think I was probably a teenager and you explaining it to me. So I thought it was interesting that you don't respond to his work since that memory made me feel like you actually liked his work. But before we get into it, I picked two of Jackson Pollock's paintings here. I do have some people in one of the photos for scale because his drip paintings are enormous. And I think that's again, an important part of their power. So number 34 from 1949, is a rectangle uh, horizontal painting that has uh, a lot of black and then some splashes of red and yellow, green, white. It is, there's some space. So you definitely see the canvas coming through the drips. And then number 31 from 1950. So basically the same time period. Isn't it interesting that number 31 is from 1950, but number 34 is from 1949? Makes me wonder if the dates are off on the internet or if he went back to rework things. But anyway, uh, this one is a more uh, neutral colored piece, shall we say. It's still in the blacks and the whites and all that stuff, but it doesn't quite have the bright reds and yellows. It's also a little bit hard to see the detail from this distance. You get more of sort of an overall effect of the chaos of the drips. So, Mom, why did you pick Jackson Pollock as one of the artists, the abstract artists you don't necessarily respond to? By the way, because I say I don't respond to something doesn't mean I don't like it. It just means it doesn't resonate for me at a deep emotional level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have to say first, I'm old enough that I remember when Life Magazine, which you probably don't remember. I have some Life Magazines actually that I use. I cut them up. So I got a big stack of Life Magazines. Well, they did an article about him. They went to his studio. They took pictures of him pouring his paint and kind of turned him into one of the first big kind of rock star American artists. Um, it was a kind of weird fame thing in the pre-internet days. Uh, I think I find that I it's difficult for me to locate the emotion in his works. That there is so much paint going on. And yet I somehow, and, and his colors don't necessarily speak to me, and I just cannot extract the emotion. Um, remember when you said you like things all over and mm -hmm. layer upon layer, and I, I don't think any of the different parts look different to me. I think if you it were for a pizza and you cut it up into pieces, to me, I would feel the same about every one of the pieces, which leaves me a little distant. So I wouldn't, with my precious dollars, I will not be purchasing millions and millions of dollars. Jackson Pollock. Yeah, I, I agree that it has a sort of sameness to me. That It's funny because I really like some of his earlier work when he was a younger artist before he found the drip paintings where there's a lot more brushwork. It's sort of, there's one a painting of his in particular that comes to my mind called She-Wolf that has a wolf in the center of it and it's kind of abstract. There's also, there's just something about his aggressive way with a brush that I really appreciate his sort of fearless color sense, you know, some of the sort of symbols and shapes that he uses. And then he starts to get into the drip paintings and I get a little bit less interested. I think for me, it comes down to like, Frank Stella is crazy and chaos, but they, though his pieces feel constructed to me. They feel like a person purposely placed some things in juxtaposition to each other, whether you like it or not. The drip paintings to me feel like a wonderful bit of performance art. I love the photos of him. I love the moments when like a curator will point out where you can see a shoe print in the painting or a cigarette butt that got painted in, you know, like I think those are some cool moments of it, but I'm not, 
I don't think that I respond to that finished piece partially because of what you said, the sameness. It does feel a little bit like just a large pattern. I will tell you that I don't feel I know him at all from seeing his paintings. So at some level, he's not communicating any part of himself. Now, it could be not just his paintings, but that he doesn't want to be known. Right. Uh, which is certainly possible. And that I is have to say, possible. I like his wife's work better, Lee Krasner. Me too, but what an unfashionable point of view it would what have been. What an unfashionable point of view. It is true. Any but Most normal people would be like, you don't like Justin Pollock? What's wrong with you? This is actually one of the things that we talk about a lot in Design Bootcamp is like people show up. One of the first exercises is I ask people to, you know, share some artists that they like and some that they don't. Because as I said earlier in the podcast, talking about art and why you like it and why you don't is a huge key into who you are as an artist. And inevitably, somebody brings in uh, Monet as something that they don't like or Da Vinci as someone they don't like, and somebody else brings it as something that they love. And like, that's the point. We all get to like different things. And just because something is popular or Clement Greenberg said it was good in the 1960s doesn't mean that like that's the rule. You get to like what you like. Um, Mondrian, thank you. thank you, you're welcome. Mondrian was another one that you picked as not a favorite. And I bet I can already guess why it is if you're yes. not familiar yes uh, well so let me just describe this for people who are listening so i picked two pieces one is victory boogie woogie which was made sometime between 1942 and 44 um it is a square canvas on the angle so in a diamond formation and it has uh, if you're familiar with mondrian at all he's exploring a lot of um, lines and squares within the lines uh, and much of his work was very much based on like city streets kind of idea um, and primary colors he's using red blue yellow with some grays and stuff like that in there so victory boogie woogie is very densely populated with these squares and lines then i found a photo from art soul life magazine of a mondrian exhibit but it didn't specify exactly where it was. These are Mondrians that um, are sort of larger, more open. It's a collection of mostly square paintings. They have black lines and then yellow, red, and blue squares and rectangles with it that fit within the black lines. I'm going to guess the reason that mom doesn't respond to Mondrian is because, again, it's intellectual and it feels very held as opposed to sort of like free and expressive. Is that a good stab in the dark? It's a good stab in the dark. I feel it's um, not juicy. It's dry mm. to me. Mm. I can appreciate the skill, but at the same time, I don't, again, I am somehow not receiving the emotion. Uh, I'm not hearing music when I mm -hmm. see his stuff. Part of it, of course, is that there's so much stuff designed with his printing or imitation of his printing uh, on it that it's almost become, I mean, it's a signature, but it's like a cliche now almost. And mm -hmm. Given that I spend a lot of time with your son doing Legos and things, I somehow see Legos now. <laughs> right. Um, I just, it's like we speak two different languages and we're not comprehending each other. Yeah, I see that. So, I mean, I think this actually gets to a question that I have that we sort of have danced around a little bit, which I think is personal which uh, is also the title of this podcast, which is what's the point of abstract art? What do you think the point of abstract art is? And because I put you on the spot before, I'll go first and just say that I can only answer for what the point is for me. So as an artist, I like to create art that uh, expresses my feelings, that shares 
bits of my life that potentially are translated in a way that nobody else can understand except for me, you know, whether I'm using symbols to represent people in my life or whether it's a color that makes me think of an experience I had. But to me, it's a sharing a little bit of something that's personal. And then I also find that abstract art for me as an artist, again, in process is a really exciting and fun puzzle of how to put things together because you can always cheat when you have something that is uh, representational. If I put a face on a canvas, you will look at that face first, right? There's a noticing hierarchy and like you will look at a face. If I put a dog on the canvas, you will look at the dog. If I put a house on the canvas, you will look at the house. And then I get to determine, do you know what I mean? Sort of where you look. When you're doing abstract art, like you have to work harder. You have to think smarter. There's a game afoot to try to get the viewer to go where you want to enter the painting the way that you're intending. And that to me is such a fun, like intellectual puzzle on top of all the like just you know, emotional sharing and like giving a piece of myself. I said to somebody, I had brought to my quick group one abstract and one representational piece. And somebody in the group who didn't know me well was like, oh, I didn't know you did any representational work. And I said, well, I find that if I only do representational work, I cheat too much. I can easily throw up something for somebody, look here, look here, you know what I mean? Whereas if I do abstract work, it pushes me and then I find my representational work gets better because instead of leading the eye in obvious ways, I'm doing it in more subtle ways and my backgrounds become less backgroundy and more integral to the composition, more interesting, you know? And so I find it really useful to switch back and forth. So at the end of the day, that's the point of abstract art for me as an artist, as a viewer, I think what I like about abstract art and what I think the point is, is I think the point is to make, or let, let me put it another way, what do I, the abstract art that I like makes me feel something, gives me a reaction, gives me something to talk about, to point at, to look at, to engage with. I want to engage with the art. And so I think that's why I'm, I'm not as attracted to things like Barnett Newman because I don't have a way to engage with it or Jackson Pollock, which feels like it pushes me out. And I feel like I do have an engage, a way to engage with stuff like Frank Stella's work or Helen Frankenfeller's work. They give you a way in. How about you? Well, I wouldn't say that first, I'm sure you'll agree, all art is not all one or all the other. Yeah. Because a lot of things that I like have elements of both. For example, uh, I'm thinking of, for example, say a Gustav Klimt, Klimt, one of those beautiful goldenish women and their dress and their hair and the background they are shimmering and somewhat abstract. If you just look closely at a small part of it, you know, it has that abstract feeling and it's part of what makes the painting of the woman so alluring to me because I'm feeling I'm feeling surrounded by her robe I'm feeling uh, a a cloud of color and light and design that isn't necessarily in a dress shape you know what I mean it's the feeling of the elements. I think I really like to feel that the artist wants to talk to me in some way. And and when I feel that he doesn't, he or she, then I am uh, not drawn in. So I think that's fine. You know, people don't go around saying like, I like every kind of music in the whole wide world. Generally, I have people have some preferences yeah uh, like so my sister like i was gonna say my sister-in-law always recommends to me depressing books every book she has given me and every book she has recommended to me is a depressing book that makes you cry and i think they're good books but i just can't like i don't want to read those i know that like 
you do feel good afterwards and they're really well written and like it brings you to your knees and like you're really involved with the characters but like i hate crying and reading a book and i know for some people it's cathartic and it's great but i i can't do sad but i just don't want to right so like you know, i read i was gonna say she's well matched with yeah. your brother yeah who's always exactly. recommending to me Depressing Japanese movies. and Korean movies that are filled with tortured people and actual torture and horrible violence. And I just, I don't like those movies. I don't want to do it. Like, I want to feel good. And so I totally understand that about art, too. Like, some people want to look at a piece of art and make it feel happy make them feel happy they, or some people want to look at art and feel at peace or some people look at art and want to feel like energized and engaged like we all get to decide how we want art to make us feel and what makes us feel comfortable so I think like that's a fun thing to think about I also well, will I say um I have a list here of 15 questions to ask yourself the next time that you're looking at a piece of abstract art to better understand and appreciate it. And I will put those 15 questions in the show notes um, so that you can have them. Uh, and you can find the show notes, by the way, at ballsresigns.com backslash arting. Um, because I think like, even like we've said, even if I don't respond to something, I do find it important to still understand why is it important? Why is it here? What can I what can I take away even if I don't like it? And again, sometimes it's not that you don't like it. It's just it's not drawing you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, so uh, I would say we should probably wrap up because this podcast has run a very long. Um, I, I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just read off the 15 things in case somebody isn't going to look up the show notes, but actually would like to hear those things okay here are the 15 questions uh what emotions or feelings does this artwork evoke in me and so there have been plenty of cases where mom and i have said nothing and that may be a problem right number two how does the use of color impact my perception of the artwork i think a lot of times when i've been describing the artwork to you we've definitely hit on color because color like you were saying about the Helen Frankenthaler being that red, that it felt alive. What do the various shapes and forms in the artwork remind me of? This is the old cloud question or the monkey that you saw in that one painting. How does the composition guide my eye across the artwork? This is a good question if you're an artist and even if you're not, to think about how are you engaging with it or are you being pushed out from it? And I think that's the Pollock problem for me is I don't go across the artwork, I'm just pushed out from it. What techniques or materials did the artist use to create this piece? This is one of my favorite games to play in a gallery or in the museum before I look at the card, you can always look at the card, is to try to guess. Do I know enough about art materials? This is my artist game to figure it out. And like I've surprised myself a couple of times where I have been able to figure it out. Or it's always exciting if you're wrong and then you're like, oh, I didn't know pastel could be used like that or whatever else it is. Number six, what might the title or any accompanying information tell me about the artist's intentions or inspiration? So I understand why artists love to use untitled because it's hard to title things and titling things it does color the work but i really find titles useful you know to figure it out and i also like it when museums and galleries provide a little more context for work that to me is also interesting some of my favorite exhibit exhibits ever like i'm thinking i've never been this is sacrilege i've never been a huge monet fan um but I love, 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 shame. I know, finger of shame, finger of shame, but I love, love, loved, there was a, an exhibit the MFA had where they showed a bunch of the Japanese art that had inspired him at some point when he had gone to Japan, and after that, I saw his work completely differently, and I, I understood things about it. It just made it deeper and more interesting to me, so that was really helpful. Um, number seven, how does this artwork compare to other works by the same artist or within the same artistic movement? 
So this could be, if you're at a retrospective of a single artist, like for instance, we went to a fabulous David Hockney exhibit at the Met several years ago, which has stayed with me. And it really showed his work like from the beginning of his career up into like the iPad drawings that he's doing right now. And that was fascinating to figure out, you know, how he had evolved and changed, how his interests, his work, all that kind of stuff. And then at the same time, you know, I'm thinking of when you walk into a room that is like, this is the abstract expressionist room and you can compare all those artists or, hey, these are all the fauvists. Okay, well, let's compare and see like, which one do I like? Which one do I don't? Why not? Do I just not? Am I in the futurism room? And all I can think is I don't like futurism or whatever it is. Uh, number eight, what is the overall mood or atmosphere conveyed by the artwork? I think this is a helpful question because it can help you understand why you do or do not engage with the work. Like, this, like we were talking about music, which I think is really helpful. You felt like the mood and the atmosphere um, you know, of the Stella works was like aggressive and unfriendly. Whereas I felt it was like, come and party with me. And I think like, that's important to know how you're reacting to what somebody's putting out. As they say, there's a hat for every head. Number nine, how does the artwork challenge or subvert traditional artistic conventions? Now, this requires you to know a little bit about art history, because there are certainly paintings that you see that were done in like 1929 that seem really boring and plain, but like at the time were a revelation. They were crazy. And that's why context can be interesting to understand why something's important, why it's in a museum. Um, you know, and you can even think about when you look at contemporary art on Instagram, are, is that person doing something really different than what's out there? Are they using materials in a way that's different? Are they talking about something that people don't usually do? Are they, you know, uh, and I think that's interesting. Uh oh, I said the I word. And I think that's compelling to think about. Uh, number 10. How does the artwork reflect the cultural, social, or political context in which it was created? So the classic example I always give for this is I went to Germany with my friend Nat Kallback, who is German. So she was living in Germany. So I visited her there. And we went to see some pieces of the Berlin Wall where people had made art. There was one piece that had all these people with bananas on their heads. And I was like, okay, people with bananas on their heads. And she was like, no, no, no. There was this whole thing when the wall came down because the East Germans had never seen a banana or tasted a banana and they went like crazy for bananas. So it was a way that the West Germans like made fun of them for being stupid or whatever because they had never seen a banana. So I had no context for understanding that banana was a way of making fun of East Germans, but she knew and she saw it. And so that's why it, it can be really important to either ask somebody or read some information to understand, you know, what some symbols or some ideas in the work might be that you're not aware of. Number 11, what do I notice upon closer inspection of the textures and details? This is my Rothko story about getting up close with those color field paintings and being like, oh, this is different than I thought. There is more here. It's mom's suggestion that the Muros have a lot more in that blue than just blue. Number 12 is something we've already talked about a lot. How does the scale or size of the artwork affect my perception of it? And I will tell you that this is the biggest, I don't want to say it's a trick, but it's kind of a gimmick which is a lot of times if you just make the work colossally enormous, it suddenly becomes impressive. It envelops you. It becomes person-sized. Suddenly it's amazing, even though it's the exact same thing. And this is true. There are lots of tricks like that. For instance, if a man quilts, amazing, you know, just when something is you know, looks like a tiny image and then you stand in front of it and it's huge, suddenly you're blown away. Um, 13, what personal experience, oh, by the way, that's like the number one thing that people say about the Mona Lisa. It's smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, number 13, what personal experiences or memories does this artwork evoke for me? So this is a little bit about, a little bit about the cloud thing, like what do you see, but also 
trying to find a way that you can connect to the art instead of just being uh, an aesthetic observer. It also gives you a good way to talk about the work with somebody else and potentially to have a really interesting conversation. I think that art can be a wonderful gateway to conversations with a friend or a family or even a stranger if you can connect it to something personal, you know, the same way that you might with a song or a story or anything else. Uh, number 14, how does the absence of recognizable imagery impact my interpretation of the artwork? So this can sometimes come down to a, do you like abstract art or do you not? Like if there were a person out there, would you, would it be better for you? If there, you know, if it were, there were a car, would you be like, oh, okay, I get it or not? And that's just really a moment for reflection for you more than anything. Number 15, what is my gut reaction to the artwork and how does it change as I spend more time with it? So you may see something and love it, spend a little time and be like, okay, ick. Uh, and I've had that happen where like there have been artists who I came across their work, let's say on Instagram, and I was like, this is amazing. And I follow them and I start to like pick apart their work and study it to think about how they're doing it. And the more I study it, the more I'm like, eh not that great. I'm not that interested in it. And of course, I've had it go the other way where there have been artists where I've been like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And then when I really get into it and study it and look at it and think about it, I am blown away by how different or how at least there's more, more there than I ever saw before. So that's exciting. Okay. 15 questions. And I think if you ask yourself these questions and engage in some reflection, I think it'll do a couple things, which is one, it helps to deepen your understanding and appreciation of abstract art. But two, it also helps you discover like your likes and dislikes. It helps you discover like your taste, which can also help you obviously make art. But it also gives you some language, I think, to talk about art, which can be extremely useful as well. And I would say, you know, the next time you're looking at something in person or online or however else, you know, pick two or three of these questions to ask yourself and just see. So a little tip that I give to some of my coaching clients when they're traveling and they don't have time, because I try to get all my clients on like a daily making art schedule. It's one of my personal uh, beliefs that that's really important. Um, is I tell them when there are times that you don't have the ability to actually make art, you can always find something artful to look at and think about art. So you need to ask yourself then a couple questions about that piece or, you know, go on a hunt for interesting shapes or whatever it is. Like there's always a way to make, to put art into your life somehow so that you always at least have your art brain on. Okay. So those are my 15 questions. Do you have any, um, anything to add mom? No, the only, uh, well, I say no, and then I say the only thing <laughs> is, uh, I think that the same things that I like in abstract art, I do like in representational art. I mean, this conversation has helped me crystallize some of the key things that I look for. And so, I, again, I don't like dividing things into discrete categories when I think that often they run together. But it's clear to me that I don't it, remember we were just talking about depressing, angry, hostile movies as opposed to ones that make you happy. I think there's sometimes a feeling that if something upsets you, it's on a higher level than if something is makes you happy, you know? Mm -hmm. The happy ending is kind of not as deep. Uh, and I just think that's wrong, that the point is the actual piece itself and not how, if whether you walk out of the theater singing and dancing or weeping. Uh, and I think that what, what scares us sometimes we think is more important work than what is emotionally fulfilling to us at some other level. So I just want to be careful not to seem to be saying, you know, one is better than the other. Again, this is about taste. Yeah. 
I think the it's thing is the whole like all art making is about taste and they say that that's the problem at the beginning of your art making journey which is your taste is better than your abilities so that's why you're frustrated with what you're making because you know it's not up to your taste um but the other thing is i find a lot of people aren't sure about their taste and this is the same thing about why there are so many fashion bloggers out there because people don't necessarily know how to dress themselves why there are so many home bloggers because people don't necessarily or you know interior designers people don't necessarily know how to put a room together so why would art be any different you might need a little bit of help with your taste not in having taste because you already have things you like and don't like but in clarifying what your taste is and in feeling comfortable that it's okay not to like things that other people like and to love things that other people hate as we've said before there's a hat for every head um, or as my yeah, brother, but is there a head for every hat? There is. And as my brother told me, uh, soon after my uh, ex-husband and I split up, he said, don't worry, Julie, even really ugly people find each other. Wow. I know. He's so lovely. He's a master, a master. <laughs> of things. It's, the sympathy was unbelievable. I felt it in that moment that even I could find someone. Uh, okay, so a couple items of interest. Practical color for painters is ongoing. Color is a foundational part of making art, as you know from our conversation. So join me for a wonderful interactive workshop that breaks all of the complicated ideas down into simple and practical lessons. You can find that at balsardesigns.com. In person this summer, I'm teaching Art Alchemy, Exploring Golden Brand Paints and Mediums. That's June 23rd through 25th here in my cozy home studio. It's a personalized art learning experience with an extremely small class. Individualized attention is given to you. You'll leave with a huge reference book. You'll understand all about golden brand paints and mediums and be an expert. I am a uh, certified golden artist educator, so I know of what I am talking. Uh, okay, so if you want to connect, you can find me at juliebalzer.com or all over social media as at Balzer Designs. I really hope you'll sign up for the free weekly newsletter. That's the best way to make sure you keep up on the latest news. There's a big button on the homepage of juliebalzer.com where you can do that, or you can go to the show page for this podcast to find the link. If you would like to help the show, and I hope that you do, you can leave a review, mention us on social media, or tell a friend. All of those things help other people find the show. So thanks so much for listening and subscribing. We'll see you the next time on the Adventures in Arting podcast.